Welcome to Babel, everyone. We've got Sean Hewitt in our virtual studio today. I'm Megan Thomas, and Sean is the author of my favorite poetry anthology of 2020, Tongues of Fire, shortlisted for the Sunday Times University of Warwick Young Writer of the Year Award, and just an all-round brilliant debut poetry collection. Thank you for joining me today, Sean. It's so good to have you on. How are you? Fine. Yeah, I'm doing it very well, actually. The sun's shining in Dublin and uh, that's brightening my mood. I've got a massive pile of marking to, to keep me company this week. So it's it's nice to have a break and actually talk to talk to a human being. So I'm really happy. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, so I'm actually, I'm in Edinburgh at the moment and today has also been the first sunny day in about a week. So we've gotten quite lucky, I think, with our lighting. (laughs) And tell me a little bit more about this period um, for teaching. It must be, must be a lot of uh, new practices needing to be employed to get everyone learning still. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to keep everyone, uh, keep everyone's energy up. I think because it's so, you know, spending so much time on screen is really difficult. And um, I found as well that I didn't realize how much of learning came from casual bits of conversation in the corridors or students getting to chat to each other in the library or, you know, even over a pint in a pub or whatever. So um, all of those things that you can't really control uh, have have been hard to replicate uh, via Zoom. Um, but no, everyone is doing really well. The students are taking it in their stride very well. And uh, I'm, I would love to say I am too. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing my best, yeah. I mean, I, I will admit, I took a few things off my syllabus this year uh, mm-hmm. that I thought we were supposed to be doing um, Hardy's Jude the Obscure. And that's just the most depressing thing, <laughs> even in a normal year. So I thought I would do everyone a favour and take that, that novel off, I, I do think. Um, you, yeah. you've, got to, you've got to pick your battles and that's not, not the year for it not the year. <laughs> yeah I'd like to now kind of launch straight into some really awesome blog questions that I've um, pulled together I got Tongues of Fire through FMCM to read for the Young um, Writers Award and so did a lot of people on Instagram and so your book mm-hmm. is in beautiful pictures all over Instagram so I reached out to some of those uh, bloggers and asked them if they could send in some questions. So um, I'll start. I'll start with those. First off, this is from Charlie Edwards Freshwater at the Book Boy. Um, a snippet of his review of Tongues of Fire is: Hewitt quickly welcomes us into a world that hums with the mysticism of nature, with a delicious undercurrent of erotica and pensive melancholy is lovely (laughs) and his question is nature imagery is so prevalent and powerful in your work have you always been a nature lover yeah I think I have um I mean I've never really grown up around any vast nature you know I grew up in a suburb um of a northern town uh so it was really parks streams bits of field on the edge of town so um but I think in some way that that consolidated how much I appreciated small things uh you know even just one tree became like a familiar tree you know how in childhood you kind of work out the this kind of mythic topography of of the place that you live in um so yeah it's never been mountains or uh you know typically pastoral places that I've been interested in. I I really love city parks and kind of overgrown graveyards and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think there's so much to be said for um, how much more you appreciate small bits when you don't have those vast landscapes or or things like that. And so um, the next question I'm going to ask is um, a similar one. So I think it, um, it flows quite nicely in. And this is from... Hope at Black Book Bitch, and her a snippet from her review is Sean Hewitt's Tongues of Fire is a poetry collection so raw and beautiful, and the images conjured by Hewitt's lyrics are crystal clear, almost cinematic. So now her question is: How would you describe your own relationship with the natural world? Which I think you've um, in part answered there. But she continues to ask: It's apparent from your Instagram and your poems that you spend a lot of time immersed in nature. 
but this relationship almost feels transcendent, reverent, and sacred. How would you encourage those who read your work to also embrace nature? Hmm. Yeah, I think I I probably do look like I spend a lot of time in nature, probably because that's just what I take a lot of photos of. Um, but it's only just the park opposite hmm. um, the house. Um, I think I find, I think everyone benefits from having something to think with, if that makes sense. And, and the natural world is a really useful thing for me to think with. It's always changing. It always surprises me. It always turns up unexpected things. So I think if you're looking for a source of inspiration, one that's constantly moving and changing is a good one. Um, because I can never, I, I don't think I could ever exhaust it, uh, which is ideal. Um, I would encourage people just to go for, go for a walk. I mean, you know, it's really as simple as that. Sometimes I, um, I don't often write poems outside, uh, but I will uh, write notes of things that I see. Um, and sometimes a line or something will come to me and then, and then I can go back home and, and work on it. But um, just spending, even spending half an hour in the same spot, and just seeing how it changes, what appears, what doesn't appear, um, can be a really useful exercise, I think, in, in noticing detail. Or, um, yeah, but I think, uh, you know, for everyone getting outside, especially now, is really important. Um, and, you know, you don't have to be, uh, I'm in the middle of the city, I'm, I'm not around uh Nature, nature. Um, so, I, you know, like a, a park, a garden, if you have one, uh, anything like that is enough. Uh, even, you know, a bird feeder outside your window uh, is, yeah. is enough. So, yeah. yeah. And I think, as you said, um, it's, it's such a great source of inspiration because even if you note down the exact same tree every day, it's going to look slightly different. Something's going to have changed. And so it's, yeah, you've got a lot of room to to write yeah so my last question from the blog is is from claire at um years of reading and so her review is um a part, part of her review is for me i found sean's poetry had a way of making me appreciate my place in the world how transient my time is and how nature is all encompassing and ever present in our lives and her question is a lot of your poetry is intensely personal when you're trying to articulate what you've gone through in your writing, how do you decide what you feel able to share and what you want to keep private? Um, I've kind of got to the point now, I, I, I wasn't at this point when I originally um, wrote, wrote the, started writing the poems in the book. I, I had one poem in there, which is the third one along, I think, Dryad, um, which I, I dare show to anyone for 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 a long time um but now i've just kind of i think once you've broken the seal um you're just like oh you know what who cares you know yeah. so i i've just kind of there's nothing that i think is particularly off off the cards for me um but getting those things into a poem is another thing so sometimes it just is whatever experience or thought that you have that you manage to assimilate into a poem, that's the one that comes out. So, so oh. there, there are things that I um, have thought, oh, I could write a poem about that, and it turns out I can't. So uh, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it really, um, it's not the embarrassment or the shame threshold I'm pushing through anymore. It's just the formal uh, thing of getting a language or a form that, can accommodate certain experiences um and i think every poet has some um, um register or um atmosphere to their poems that is that draws out certain things and locks other things away you know there are some things that don't seem to fit in a sean hewitt poem and i and the challenge is to change the poem or the, the way that you write enough that you can eventually fit more of those things in. So um, I'm seeing it as a writing challenge rather than a personal challenge. I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I mean, I wish I could just keep asking other people's questions, but I feel like that would be cheating. So I'm going to stop there and um, talk about the thread linking the bloggers, which was, of course, their mutual love of Tongues of Fire, but also uh, the Sunday Times Young Writer, Sunday Times University of Warwick Young Writer of the Year Award. Uh, the pandemic edition must have been a bit strange. Were there were there still um, online events? Were you able to meet the other shortlisters? Virtually? No, no. We, um, I mean, it was strange because for all of us, it was our first book. So I don't think any any of us had anything to compare to compare the experience to. Uh, but ordinarily, we would have had this lovely reception would have been drinks there would have been you know a chance to get to know everyone um and this year we didn't uh we have been invited to the next year's event um but we when we found out who was shortlisted we all kind of messaged each other on instagram and said oh congratulations nice to meet you so we do all kind of we have all spoken in that way um but no we didn't have a chance to um all be together in a room there wasn't a zoom ceremony or anything like that it was, um, they left it to the judges to to talk uh, which was quite nice actually because i i don't think i would have liked to be on screen yeah in that moment so yeah yeah it's always quite stressful trying to decide when's your turn to talk especially when there's multiple people in a zoom yeah. chat. to do with your face when you're not talking i think that's <laughs> another thing yeah so it must have been a strange experience. I don't know um, if you read all the shortlisted, but kind of seeing who are considered your contemporaries. What what was that? What was that experience like? It was interesting. Uh, like I, I suppose we were all doing the the really nice thing about the shortlist is how different everyone's books were. Mm. Um, so we were all. I don't think that felt because of the formal differences as as well as just the diversity of of the people that were shortlisted it didn't feel like we were all one generation doing one generation's work um there were you know there was Nisha Dolan's book which um I suppose like in the media might have been seen as as the most typical or, or not typical it's a great book uh but uh millennial you know like it might have seemed to be of our generation um and then Catherine's Catherine Cho's book uh, Marina Kemp's novel and Jay's book you know they're also different uh they were also formally diverse uh yeah I mean it's a it was a real honor to be put alongside them um I loved all the books I love them all. And, and you know, I really don't envy the judges because <laughs> choosing between those books is like choosing between five completely different things. Yeah. You know, there was no comparisons to be made, I don't think. I think it was a really difficult one. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And, yeah, there was no real kind of, did they all do this? Kind of, which one did this better? You, you couldn't do that because they were all just so different. Yeah, and they all just spoke to different um, to different facets of, of contemporary culture. And, and really, it kind of showed that there is no one generation or, or one culture or one audience. You know, I think what was nice about it, uh, particularly for the poets, um, is that it meant that people who usually read novels read read the poems um and it was really nice to have people that maybe don't usually read poetry mm. uh, come to the work and enjoy it and be like oh okay right well, it's not so scary after all well, no <laughs> i think people kind of one thing that's strange about poetry is that they people seem to feel the need to have to say something about the form rather than the actual poem. Whereas I don't think people approach the novel so much being like, what is this formally do? You know, like a general readership, you read, you read the novel and you enjoy it or you don't enjoy it. Uh, but with a poem, I think we think that more is expected of us than just enjoying the poem sometimes. And there's an anxiety that, uh, you know, the poem is cleverer than we are. <laughs> But the poem isn't clever. The, the <laughs> reader, you know, like it, the, the the reader makes the poem. So it's whatever, yeah. whatever 
whatever you get out of it is is enough. And I think that taking that pressure off everyone's shoulders is necessary. Yeah, definitely. I think and this poetry seems to be the only art form that we kind of feel this obligation towards. No one's kind of counting the tempo of a song they like, <laughs> yet suddenly the rhyme scheme of a poem is something that people feel they need to stress themselves over. Yeah, lovely. So you won other awards, the Northern Writers Award, the Resurgence Prize, the Eric, Eric Gregory Award, um, and you also on some panels, I believe, um, judging um, a poetry award. Uh, did I read that correctly? Yeah. With regards to literary awards in general, and I often forget how niche literary prizes can be because they're so important to me in my little bookish world. Yeah. What do you think their value is and how do they reflect what's being written and do you think they're important? Um, I think first and foremost, what is most important is a readership and a connection with a reader. And that's that should be the only thing that really matters to a writer. Um, I think prizes can be useful, uh, you know, for bringing those readers. <laughs> that, can, that That's a really useful tool. Um, I'm not really sure, you know, I think if I was in charge, I'd probably have a rule where every book can only be shortlisted for one prize. Because I think part of the the value of an award is bringing to the attention of people a variety of books. And, and I think that if we are to have awards, we should see it as, a, as an opportunity to bring exciting things forward, not to just continually law yeah. the same book over and over again. Um, but um, I think particularly for emerging writers the, the awards that i'm on the panel for uh, for poetry island and for poets and players in manchester um that money and that recognition is really important um to poets who don't get advances for their books really you know they get a tiny advance maybe um so i think that the security that that can bring and the validation that that can bring is really important um I think ideally, you know, we wouldn't be in competition with each other. But I think if we are to have awards, uh, we should kind of see them as opportunities to clap as many people as possible uh, rather than compete. I'm not, I'm not really into competition. Well, I think, and it seems with plenty of awards, it seems that the focus is more on the long list, the short list, and just having the opportunity to read them all and know that um, these books that you might never have picked up, someone's, yeah. it's, it's almost like a recommendation. It's like a book review. It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, it's really valuable. And um, I think particularly for, you know, if you're shortlisted for an award, it brings you more readers, and that's what you want as a writer. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think I think I suppose what I'm saying is it would be nice if we could democratize the uh, bringing of yeah. readers to as many people who deserve them as we can. Uh, so, but yeah, yeah I'm yeah. Thinking about awards, but I'm, I'm very grateful to be shortlisted for. <laughs> no, <it doesn't. laughs> you know, like <laughs> that is a thing to not shortlisted me for anything. <laughs> no, um, I'd love to get a little bit more into your process and the actual kind of writing down of the poems, which um, could be a tricky question, could be an easy one, depending on um, how you go about it. But can you tell me a bit about the process, basically, from scraps of paper with ideas on it to the book that, that we read today? Yeah. Uh, although I'm, I think it always follows a relatively similar process, which is that I, um, I write notes down on my phone or in a notebook, um, sometimes just lines or words or images or maybe a scene or a memory or something. Um, and then I just keep on writing them until I, uh, I suppose it's kind of a hard to define. I get a, a feeling that it's ready to come out. So I sit down <laughs> and write. 
Um, and sometimes I, I try and I jump the gun a bit and I'm too early to write the poem and it <laughs> fails. But um, Hasn't yeah. had time to rise. Yeah. Like yeah. function bread. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly like that, actually. Um, an underproofed. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, and then there's loads of stages of drafting and revision as as I go through. Um, the earliest poem in Tongues of Fire is probably from, I'd say it's probably about eight eight years old, maybe, or, or there are lines in the book that are eight years old. You know, maybe the poems didn't survive. Uh, and the newest one was written in about September before the book came out in April, so um yeah yeah um a long process in which many poems were written that didn't go into the book and uh in which well I suppose you learn as you go which is a difficult thing about a first collection because it's constantly changing and you never know quite when to yeah free. <laughs> yeah save that for the next one <laughs> yeah um, is, is there a next one? Are you working on a on another anthology? Um, yeah, I, I, I hope that there will be. Yeah. Um, I think I've never... It's strange with the first collection, you write a load of poems until you finally feel like you have enough poems that you like and then you put them in an order and you're like, oh, this seems to be a book about X, Y, Z. Whereas... With the second collection, I think maybe what's stalling me a little bit is that now I'm aware that the book will probably be published if I write it. Uh, so I'm thinking, oh, well, what is this book about? And I'm kind of pre-empting the poems before I've written them. So I think I need to unplug from expectation for a while. Uh, I will write another book, um, but I doubt that I will write one quickly. I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've also got plenty to work on because your memoir should be coming out soon, which is exciting. Yeah. Um, what What's the difference then between um, writing that and writing your poems? It must It must be similar in some ways because they're both personal writing experiences and also very different. Yeah. Um, the main thing. I found, actually, I, I was never anxious um, about the poetry book in terms of uh, it's, it being a reflection of me, if that makes sense. Uh, as in, I, uh, what we were talking about earlier, that sense of putting yourself on the page. Uh, in a poem, you have so many opportunities to hide or to escape, uh, and you can... You know, you could have a whole poem that just said, it is like X, it is like Y, it is like Y. And you would never actually have to say what it was. You know, you can let the reader infer what that is. So you're hiding a little secret in the poem. But in prose, you can't really do that because people will get tired of you <laughs> really quickly. Uh, so I think uh, what I found um, disconcerting about prose is that you have to describe everything you have to give a motive a setting the re results of, of that thing and you can't look away you can't just get up and leave the room and leave your character inside the room <laughs> you have to stay there until until they've said or done what what it is that you wanted to say mm -hmm. um so that not being able to hide in prose uh is a much more scary thing. Um, but I'm I'm really enjoying the uh, the process of having um, this big bulk of text to work through. I'm kind of approaching it like a jigsaw. Mm -hmm. uh, so I spend some nights like, well, if I tweak this bit, what does that do to chapter eight or something? You know, like so it's it's kind of a fun logic puzzle in that way. Uh, that I'm enjoying and it's a different way of working um, but it also means that if I'm used to focusing on 14 lines and getting those right in writing a book that is 60 odd thousand words um, you can't do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, when when is that coming out? Is there a date yet? Um, hopefully, it's build. It's coming out in the UK with Cape, um, and then with Penguin Press in America. Um, and we're not decided yet if it's coming out at the same time or not. Uh, but it will be out in the UK in, I think July, maybe June, twenty twenty two. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, theoretically. I mean, it, it is so interesting to um, hear about people kind of having, um, not, and I, I don't know if you're necessarily finished, but finishing things so far from when they're published. So it must actually be quite a strange experience when it eventually comes out and actually it's two years old. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. I, I was once listening to a um, podcast, I think Madonna was on it, and they were asking her, you know, like, do you ever get bored of having to sing? Vogue over and over again um because you know for some people it's just so exciting and new mm -hmm. and for some people you know madonna she's, <laughs> she's just i would assume she's over it yeah. um, so i think that's one of the things you have to kind of let um readers bring that excitement back for you after you've left mm -hmm. it uh, and, and I think what's quite nice about it is that usually by the time the book's out, you're a little bit disconnected from it and you're you're excited to hear what people think and what they read into the book because you're not trying to tell them what mm -hmm. they read into it. Um, but yeah, I started the memoir um, like three years ago now, so it'll be a long time afterwards by the time it's published. But yeah, it's nice though because you're you know, then I can forget about it. Yeah. Well, you won't read it once it's published. Well, that, is that too dangerous? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I... Do, I Next I, thing you start a typo and it's game over. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes I have kind of dipped into, you know, I had a glass of wine or something and dipped into my own book. Um, and sometimes I'm like, oh, pleasantly surprised. It's not as bad as I thought. Um, but I am wary, particularly after... Tongues of Fire came out of being too um, conscious of my myself and, and how people read the work because I don't want to then sit down and think, oh, I have to write a Sean Hewitt poem now um, and having that in my head. Uh, so the more I can unplug from it, I think the better. Uh, yeah. Speaking of Sean Hewitt poems, um, would you please uh, read one for us? Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I've asked audience, I've asked Sean if he could read one. Um, that's one of the earliest ones in his anthology. So kind of taking us right back to how it all started. Yeah, I think I'm actually going to read you the, um, it's a poem called More, and it has a little story in that um, I was, I think I would have been 21 when I wrote it. Um, I got a job after university as an apprentice poet in residence at Ilkley Literature Festival. Uh, and I didn't realise that, uh, I think they paid me something like 100, 100 quid a week or something, which I thought was great. Um, but I realised it wasn't enough to actually stay in Ilkley in a hotel and, and be there. Uh, so I um, had a, got a tent and camped on the moor. Um, and it was only later that I realised that they had actually had an empty hotel room waiting for me in the <laughs> in the village so I was up there in like no. uh, on a wall um and I I wrote kind of some diary notes and then I found them again a couple of years ago and made them into a poem so even though it's not the oldest poem it's the oldest lines right. in the book uh, so it's just made up of notes uh, from that journal uh, and it's called more more is childless, sulks, speaks rain and sudden light, is a mind, is sleepless, lies deep in its bed, is always moving about at night, speaks fog with its moss mouth, is turned to sea by the wind, is waves in the dark crashing, 
is suddenly still, is a trembling of light on the tent, is a shudder of guy ropes and a shadow passing, is kept awake by its conscience, is always waiting, sounds like breathing, sounds like it is carrying bodies at night when no one is watching, is a swallower of sound, wants every night to reach up and swallow the moon, swallow something, is a mouth, hides and is never caught, sits in the dark quietly and smiles as the farmer walks out again with his torch beam, calling and calling a name. Thank you. That was wonderful. And such a peaceful note to go out on. Um, it's been so great chatting to you. Uh, thank you. It's been lovely hearing um, insights into uh, something that I enjoy. So it's, it's strange to be able to uh, talk to a creator of something you enjoy before. <laughs> well, so thank you. It's been a Thank you very much. I'm really glad you enjoyed the, the book and it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for having me. And thank you to our audience for listening and follow everyone, all of us on our social media platforms. We'll post links and um, in our notes, our show notes and in the YouTube comment section. Please feel free to let us know what you thought and bye. <laughs>